Thank you very much, Landon. Can the people in the back hear me? Yes. Yes, good. It's a very nice space. It's unusual for me. I don't, not, I don't have familiarity with, uh, or I'm not used to, let's say, speaking in a space with, uh, with all of these contraptions. It's very impressive. <laughs> uh, there's no multimedia coming, you know, I'm sorry. So it's just not my cup of tea, at least not in the theology that I do. Uh, so I'll be speaking for about an hour, and then we'll have some back and forth. We'll have some question and answer, some discussion time here until uh, a few minutes after 8. And then we'll, we will uh, uh, migrate over into the hallway of wherever we're led by the team. Um, and I hope you have your handout. Does everyone have the sheet? Yes? Good. I'll be referring to that starting uh, in about 10, 10 minutes or so. You might know that uh, since the time of Plato and the ancient Greeks, the time of Plato, Aristotle, and th many of their disciples, human beings throughout the West have been pondering and thinking about and arguing about the nature of contemplation. They've been doing it in philosophy. They've been doing it in theology as well. Contemplation, so this would be the gaze toward the creator, the Jew or the Christian would say, or the Platonist might say, gazing toward the one with a capital O. The one who, for the Platonists, is beyond being and language. That might sound a little bit Buddhist to you. Maybe it is. We don't know the relation between Buddhism and Platonism. Who knows what happened on the, on the Silk Road? Um, Eastern Orthodox Christians and Catholics and Jewish and Muslim philosophers from the Middle Ages forward have been drawing inspiration, really from antiquity forward, have been drawing inspiration from the Greek philosophers, the pre-Christian philosophers, above all Plato and some Platonists like Plotinus, to find tools to start to express and describe as best they can um, what it is for the human being to contemplate, to gaze toward, to gaze upon God, but also to be in communion with the immaterial, the invisible God, to be in contact with God, a contact of the mind, a contact of the heart, perhaps both. And I'll be speaking to you about the, the mystical, and by this term I mean a somewhat intelligible, but really mostly mysterious type of contemplation and spiritual contact or union with God. The mystical runs through the gamut of philosophy and religions in virtually every historical era. We will not even get into the great East Asian and South Asian uh, traditions. We simply cannot do so. Time does not allow for it. And that would make my presentation terribly superficial and boring, full of stupid generalizations. I will not do this. But you realize that one doesn't have to be a Christian in, in order to think about this. Right? You don't need to be a believer. You don't need to be a Jew. You don't need to be a Muslim. Interestingly, uh, this is a very, if you will, ecumenical topic, right? Protestants are interested, Catholics, Eastern uh, Christians, Eastern Orthodox, <laughs> certain Jews, certain Muslims, certain <coughs> people who are just spiritual seekers, people who might be agnostics are interested in this area. But curiously, uh, just about every great Catholic theologian developed a mystical theology, a theological account of union with God, see? So that means it's not something that's just on the fringes of Christianity or the fringes of Catholicism. The major voices of Catholic thought through the centuries have been involved in the project. For example, St. Augustine, the Confessions, has a rich mystical theology. The De the, the Trinitate, his work on the Trinity, has a mystical theology. You may have trouble finding it, but it's there. St. Maximus the Confessor, who perhaps is the greatest master for the Eastern Orthodox and many Eastern Christians, including Catholic Christians. Um, the 20th century Swiss theologian Hans Urs von Balthasar has, definitely has a mystical theology. And I'm going to argue today that uh, Thomas Aquinas actually belongs on this list of mystical theologians. You might say, well, that, how can that be? You know, He wrote the Summa of Theology. It's very dry. You know, very scholastic, very Aristotelian. There's no poetry. Well, he actually did write poetry. You maybe didn't know that, but, but Aquinas doesn't strike us, usually those of us who know a little bit about the history of Catholic thought, he doesn't strike us as a mystical theologian or a mystic. But he was. You'll see. <laughs> I'm going to go back to the term mystical. Mystical is very mysterious, this term, isn't it? What does it mean? It means many things in the literature today. 
Is it dangerous? Is it problematic? Does it lead to heresy? There's a common phrase that we have in some circles of religious uh, brothers or sisters and theologians. Mysticism. It begins in mist and it ends in schism. <laughs> my, my gloss on that, well, not necessarily. It depends on the kind. It depends on the type. Okay? I employ the term mystical in a very specific way, which, in fact, is very consistent with the way it's been used for about 1,700 years. And it's this. It is really not about visions or locutions or levitations or hearing interior voices. It's not about such strange supernatural phenomena. They are, in fact, completely secondary to Christian mystical theology. They're interesting, they're fascinating, but they're not central to mystical theology. If you have not received any so-called mystical visions, count your blessings. It's probably better this way. Uh, when I was a young priest, I was probably two months uh, ordained, you know, and I was in the parish, and this old, pious uh, Catholic, older, pious Catholic man comes to confession, and at a certain point he says to me, Oh, Father, I wish you could read my soul, like Padre Pio. I said, I don't. I'm very happy that I can't read your soul. <laughs> So this evening, I will, not, I will speak about a hidden metaphysical reality, a joining of the soul to God that exceeds what is possible for our natural powers. There you have a small, sort of brief, let's say, definition of the mystical. It's a transformation of the human person. It actually tends to be a habitual, ongoing reality, much more than a sort of momentary reality with a few peak experiences. And this uh, union includes a gift of new knowledge, and a gift of new love for God and neighbor. This uh, reality, this supernatural reality, may or may not, usually does not, bring about with it extraordinary experiences or special modes of awareness of the presence of God. By the way, the focus on interior awareness of the presence of God is very modern. It's tied to all sorts of modern philosophical anthropologies that include Descartes and many other influences. It's not terribly um, central to the reflections of the more classical authors, which is good to remember, I think. One of our problems, I think, is we, we moderns, we're all moderns, right? We're all sons of Descartes in some way, sons and daughters of Descartes, whether we want to be or not. And so we look at the classical texts, whether it's Augustine or Plato or Dionysus the Areopagite or Meister Eckhart, and we're reading him with these modern glasses because that's what we need to do, that's who we are and we don't realize what the glasses are doing. And so it might take a long time to learn to take off the glasses and just finally see the text before you. Right? You're never totally just 100% neutral and objective, but you can get pretty close. You can get pretty close. I've chosen a strange interlocutor to talk about mystical union. I've chosen a 13th century Dominican whom I've studied for about the last 20 years more than anybody else. He's famous for his Aristotelianism, for his dry metaphysics, for his many, many distinctions, his beloved term, secundum quid, in a certain sense, you know. He's less known for his Platonism and his biblical commentaries, but there's a good deal of Platonism in Aquinas' thought, as there is in any medieval theologian's thought. And he wrote a great deal on scripture, the Gospels of Matthew and John, all of the letters of Paul, many of the Psalms, the book of Job. It's a great deal of, of literature on scripture. This is a less known Thomas. Now to follow Thomas's thinking about union with God, we have to touch on a few aspects of his philosophy and theology that form sort of the background, okay? So we need a little bit of the background, the doctrinal background, the, the certain ideas, let's say, firm convictions that he's got, which help to explain his overall approach to union. And as we look at his mystical theology and as we look at the background ideas, what we'll find is that he's using all the philosophical tools at his disposal, as well as scripture and the wisdom of the saints. What we'll find is a thinker who is at once a beneficiary of tradition, 
but also willing and able to exercise critical thinking about his predecessors, including saints. We will find a man who is both rational and pious. He is both conceptually clear, he's famous for that, he's also very aware of the limits of human language, maybe less known for that. And I also think that Thomas's insights can help us to better understand the actual characteristics or nature of this uh, union, because you see, ultimately, I'm not engaged in a historical project to try to reconstruct what one historical figure thought about X. I'm interested in the truth of the matter, because I think the stuff is real. And I think Aquinas actually has true insights many times. He's not infallible. He gets it wrong here and there, but he's really good. He's very insightful. Okay. When you study a thinker seeking the truth of the matter, he becomes so much more interesting. The best historians of theology are not pure historians who only do history. It's theologians who are doing theology as they're doing history. They're thinking with the author. They have climbed into his head and they are doing the same project. They're thinking with him. It's fascinating. So, step number one, preliminary considerations, the background for a theology of union with God. I am going to begin with his anthropology. You might say, well, that's strange. Brother, father, that's kind of strange. Why don't you talk about God or experience? No, I want to talk about anthropology. Anyone who theorizes about or is seeking a, uh, to describe union with God, union with the transcendent, with the one, with the creator, with the trinity, has either an explicit or an implicit vision of the human being. Example. It comes out in text number one, which I'm not going to read, but it's there for you to take home and ponder. It's a classic, classic text from Plato and the Parmenides. This text about contemplative ascent to the one beyond language and being assumes an anthropology that he articulates for us in many places in his corpus, he being Plato. For example, it assumes that the human soul, or he would say the nous, the mind, pre-exists. It's been reborn. See? You didn't begin to exist in this life. You had other lives before. It also assumes that the soul has a quasi-divine identity. It's not just human. It's more. It's superhuman by nature. That helps to make sense of how Plato describes and accounts for the highest forms of contemplation. And so you see, Plato's dualistic view of the human being, or at least Plato as he's been massively received in the tradition, we can argue about the historical Plato, but I'm not going to, that's, beyond the, that's beside the point really. Plato has understood by just about everybody for many, many centuries as a dualistic view of the human being. This shapes his account of contemplation and union with the one. Everybody has an, at least an implicit anthropology. Buddhism does. Sufi mysticism does. Everybody has one. What is it? It's terribly crucial to answer that question. And this is where Thomas's approach becomes really interesting, in my opinion. Because, you know, in Christian spirituality, often we find lots of platonic strands and ideas and echoes more so than the Aristotelian ones. But, but Thomas, in his anthropology, he's really Aristotelian. So how does that fit with a spirituality or a theology of contemplation? You see, Aquinas was convinced that Aristotle, who was, of course, Plato's student, got it right when it came to the soul-body composite. The soul and the body are so intimately united that they make one being. There are two things or two substances stuck together. That's almost like a terrible heresy for Aquinas. He's so convinced that that's wrong. Okay? He's convinced that the soul is not in the body as in a prison, but the soul is at home in the body. If you have a problem with the body, it's because of original sin and your sin. It's not because of the body. Mm -hmm. Now, the way we are, the way the soul and the body are united and function at the way they are, simply metaphysically, shapes the way we know things, okay? 
Epistemology follows from metaphysics. There's a mode of knowing, and thus knowing contemplatively, even by grace, that is profoundly shaped by the way the soul is made to be with and in the body. And so, with Aristotle, Thomas holds that our knowledge is always, always mediated by the senses. Plato disagrees. Now, when I say mediated by the senses, that could be your personal observations with um, various microscopes and neat scientific gadgets that you're learning to use in this university. It could be your simple daily perception of you know, the birds chirping and the trees on campus. It could be your conversation with a witness to something. The witnesses will tell you where and when you were born. Right? You know that by sense experience, namely the experience of someone giving testimony or an institution giving you testimony with your birth certificate. Sense experience, including everything you read, right? all of this is coming through the senses. So it's far more than just sort of scientific observation that we're dealing with. What Thomas's point is, is that there's no lingering memory of a past life. There's no lingering memory of some divine illumination that happened just directly, let's say, at some point in the past, which you can then finally get to if you're trained properly. It doesn't exist. Any interior illuminations that we might receive by prayer, by meditation, will make no sense unless we take whatever is being said to us and put it together with our daily experience and what we learn through daily life and through books and through our upbringing and various traditions. If we don't do that synthesis, therefore bringing the, the, the illumination back to the senses, we will not understand anything. So you can tell that having a mentor or being in a tradition or knowing good philosophy will become very important. And so if you think, for example, of the biblical seers, right? Um, how can, let's say, the prophet Isaiah explain to you what he's learned by contemplation, by a special interior gift about who God is. He has to come up with comparisons to or analogies from daily life. God is like a potter and Israel is like the clay that is being shaped. God is the artisan. right? He has to, for himself even to understand the revelation, come back and make these analogies. God is a, an artisan. God is like a gardener walking around the Garden of Eden, planting things and keeping them alive, etc. And so there's no knowledge without what we call in technical language the return to phantasms. Okay? This holds even for the summit of mystical contemplation. Text 2 will point you in this direction. You can look at it later. Take it home and meditate on it if you want. Now, you know, I don't think that Thomas adopted that point of view simply because he liked Aristotle. I mean, sometimes he crit criticizes Aristotle or he ignores Aristotle. He's not a slave of Aristotle. Why did he adopt this view? In my opinion, I cannot prove it to you. It is a very strong hunch because it explains so much. I think what he's doing is drawing more consequences from the Christian belief in the Incarnation, <clears throat> which reveals to us, among other things, the goodness of the body. By becoming man, God shows us that the body should not be an obstacle to happiness and to holiness, that the body can truly participate in the path of human perfection, including perfect human contemplation enabled by grace. So I propose that what Thomas is doing is developing a Christocentric mystical theology. And the challenge of mystical theologies will be to, to benefit from, from the Platonic traditions and to see its limits and to make sure that the synthesis with the doctrine of the Incarnation happens. That's a very hard task that takes centuries. We still, in theology, in the Church's life, have not drawn all the consequences of the Incarnation. It's too rich. I think Thomas drew one of them. Aquinas drew a lot of inspiration from Aristotle, and he drew from various aspects of Neoplatonic, Platonic, and Neoplatonic uh, philosophy and theology. He did so um, for another theme that I want to talk about very briefly. It's part of the background, okay? He's looking at one particular Platonic tradition. It goes back to uh, 
the uh, fifth century non-Christian, so a pagan philosopher named Proclus, as well as Aristotle, to develop a vision of creatures as agents or actors that cooperate with God in technical language, instrumental causality. Instrumental causality. Thomas is very firm on the following principle that he develops with the help of these predecessors. Creatures operate and can do things because God enables them to do so. The action of creatures never excludes God's action. Instead, it presupposes God's action. And this is why I've given you text three. It's a little bit dense, and for those of you not used to classical or ancient medieval philosophy, it might be a bit odd, but we'll read it anyway. Text number three on your sheet. The human being can only employ the power of the will given to him inasmuch as he acts in God's power. But that in whose power an agent acts is cause not only of the power, but also of the act. This is evident in the artisan in whose power the instrument acts, even if it does not have its proper form from the artisan, but is only applied to act by him. The last uh, example he's referring to, think of an, uh, a carpenter using a tool uh, to maybe uh, give a particular shape uh, to uh, a piece of wood to create a bench or something else, a table. Okay? So more than any Christian thinker before him, Thomas articulated, or let's say developed in detail, the principle that human action simply does not stand in opposition to or diminish or exclude divine action. The more God operates in me, the more I do. And this philosophical principle informs everything he does, from his theology of creation to his account of grace to his account of, account of the sacraments, etc. It's very important because most modern philosophies, starting with late medieval philosophy named nominalism, uh, move in a completely different direction. Okay? It's been argued that the Protestant Reformation is largely based on a philosophical mistake on this issue. And people f have probably proven it from the texts of Luther. Okay? It's fascinating. So that's my second point on the background. And you'll see how this gets applied. Huh? I'm going to make one more point on the background and then background, and then we'll get into our main our main theme, we'll, we'll get into a direct treatment, I should say, of the theme. The third background involves a doctrine of analogy or divine naming. Now, this is a huge field. We've, killed, uh, we've cut down many forests to publish the articles and books that describe this, and we've had endless debates among various philosophers and theologians on this. Some of you might be aware of it. I'm going to give you the super, super simple view, okay? And somebody will say, well, you're generalizing. Well, yes, I am. I have to. That's the point. Right? So uh, you might say that all generalizations are bad, but the problem is that that's a generalization. Okay? So you can't tell. Uh, you're not going to get me. You're not going to get me. Okay? I've been trained to deal with these things. <laughs> There's a threefold way of naming God for Thomas. This really comes from... Uh, his teacher, Albert, who is inspired by a figure we'll soon look at, Dionysius, the Areopagite, and, and Aristotle's in the background and various Platonic thinkers, okay? A threefold way of naming God. There's affirmation, there's negation, and there's eminence. This model applies to any divine name. It could be God is being, God is true, God is love. It could be a triune name, God the Father, God the Son, okay? Um, Here's an example of a threefold way of naming God. Number one, step number one, I affirm, I posit that there's wisdom in God, and I do so on the basis of the created wisdom that I have discovered around me, hopefully within myself as well, but probably more so around me. Right? There's created wisdom. Your grandmother's wisdom, if she's wise. Right? There are a few things in creation like grandmother's wisdom. Where does that wisdom come from? Well, if you have a, a metaphysics like Aquinas does and a theology of creation, you'd say ultimately it comes from God who gave her all of that mental power, who gave her those experiences by his providence, uh, who gave her those rich traditions from which she learned and in which she grew and progressed. Okay? In technical terms, 
God is the efficient and exemplar causality, exemplar, that rings the bell for some of you because that's platonic, and it is, right? God is the efficient and the exemplar causality. He's the ultimate source of every single perfection of all the things around you, all creatures, including the wisdom of human beings. I affirm that something like this <laughs> is in God because he causes the perfections he's got. If he doesn't have it, he doesn't cause it. But he has all of them because he's pure actuality. That gets us into a different discussion, which we will not pursue. God is pure actuality. The second step, I negate all forms of finitude or limitation. I deny all imperfections of God. Okay? You see, whenever I think of uh, some kind of wisdom, I do so, even God's wisdom, I do so, I think about that on the basis, by referring back to, perhaps without even reflecting on it, I refer spontaneously back to some kind of creaturely wisdom I've experienced. Maybe the wisdom of one of your professors, right? All your professors know many things, and some of them are also wise. <laughs> I'm not trying to be sarcastic, you know. I mean, it's the same with my teachers, right? So... None of the limitations that I find in creaturely wisdom can apply to God because he's, he's pure goodness, he's pure truth, he's pure actuality. You can argue that philosophically, you can confirm it by divine revelation. Right? So here's the problem. He's not exactly wise the way we're wise. Your grandmother wasn't always wise. Maybe she was young and crazy and dumb as a teenager. right? She became wise. God didn't become wise. God didn't need to look at you and follow your life track to become wise. Who do you think you are anyway, right? He was always wise. That's why he could create this marvelous universe. So the, the, negate, the, the limitation does not apply. In that sense, he's not wise the way humans are wise. What is he? Step three, eminent naming. I attribute unimaginably great infinite, endless perfection such as wisdom to God. His wisdom is so excellent I can't even describe it to you in a way that does it justice. It's beyond language in that sense, you might say. It's beyond words, huh? It's too, it's too big. And so, you know, the, in, in Christianity, the scriptures, in a way, are trying to give you always yet another description of something marvelous that God is doing because the scriptures can never stop saying they, they never get to the point where they've said it all. Right? So in the Gospel of John, at the end it says, you know, we've given you a taste here, a selection of what Jesus did. If we were to write down everything that he did, the whole world couldn't contain the books. Huh? That's analogy. Analogy is these three together. It's affirmation, negation, and eminence. And as you have prob probably figured out, this threefold way of naming is very philosophical. But in fact, it applies to any interpretation of scripture or a saint's work or a sacred text. Note also that it describes a way of uh, speaking. It's about language. It's also about the way we know God. See? The two go together. Naming God and thinking about him, knowing him, coming to understand him, at least partly an inadequate but true way goes together with the way I speak of God. We need a threefold way of naming God to have a coherent mystical theology. So I finished my, my uh, work on the background. We had three themes. We had anthropology, the soul body unity, instrumentality, cooperation with God, being empowered, if you will, by God to act, and the third was analogy or the threefold way of naming God. And now we can jump into the very heart of the matter. And we'll start to look at texts as well. The method I'm using of using this handout, giving you a handout with all these texts, is one I learned from my mentor, Father uh, Gilles Marie, who I think is uh, the world's leading um, uh, expert on the Trinity. Uh, he's written many things on the Trinity, and he's been published by Oxford Press and other places, and he's always invited to speak about the Trinity because he knows so much. He knows so much that when the Trinity is no longer sure about some aspect of uh, its interior life, the Trinity goes and pays a visit to Father Gilles in Faber, Switzerland, and says, C could you explain to us the notions and processions one more time? And he'll say, ah, it's very simple. <laughs> 
St. Augustine and St. Thomas teach us that, etc., etc. <laughs> He would not be happy with me if you he heard me saying this, but he, I think he knows I say it, so, you know. <laughs> He'll scold me the next time I see him. Yes. Aquinas was one of several uh, 13th century theologians who appropriated a little gem, a little gem of Eastern, ancient Eastern Christian mystical theology called the Mystical Theology, written by a very obscure figure, Dionysus. Dionysus is already fascinating. You may not have heard of him, but you should have. Dionysius Areopagita, we say in, in, in Greek, or Dionysius. Oh, I need to show you Dionys Dionysius. I brought him with me. This is, I should have shown you at the beginning. A visual aid is always a wonderful thing, isn't it? Usually it is. Here's Dionysius. Dionysius the Areopagite. Look at the icon. What's strange about this icon? What's odd about this particular saintly figure? What's strange about it? The Dominicans may not answer. <laughs> the halo is blue. The halo is blue. It's supposed to be a brighter color, isn't it? Gold, maybe, right? Why is it blue? He's the only figure I know of who's got a blue halo. There might be one or two other saints out there that have a blue halo. He's the first one I've seen. Why? Any clue? Yeah. This is so good. I love this. Any clue? Because it's the ladder into heaven. And what's the ladder into heaven? It's mystical. It's mystical, yeah. The problem is she's a professional theologian. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she, and she knows a few things about mystical union anyway, so not just theology. He talks in the center of his account of union with God is the figure of Moses at the summit of Mount Sinai in the dark cloud. The artist is saying he's in the dark cloud. That's a good thing. It's a good thing. He also says that the darkness is a way to describe the luminosity of God, which is so luminous that it's darkness in relation to us because we're so far down here. See? Isn't it lovely? This is a print. It's not an original icon. It's a printout. Okay. I'll leave him here. You can, you can gaze upon him later. <laughs> or you can pick him up later, you know. So, so Dionysus, a fascinating figure. Um, he presents himself as a writer under the, in a pseudo, with the pseudonym of a disciple of St. Paul who appears in the book of Acts in the New Testament. A Greek convert to the preaching of Paul and to the faith. Okay. In fact, he's a 6th century Syrian uh, Greek-speaking philosopher, theologian who might have been a layman or maybe a monk. He's depicted here as a priest. He's got a stole. He does not have the bishop's hat. Okay. He's important. Some people attribute um, a good deal of the inspiration for Gothic architecture to Dionysus. That's been disputed, but certainly he's part of the influence. He's one of the influences on Gothic architecture, which, which blossomed starting in the 12th century. I was visiting friends and family in Vienna and Austria. You should go to Vienna. It's a beautiful city. And uh, I walked into a big bookstore, just a secular bookstore, not a Catholic bookstore. I went to the religion section. What did I find? Three different German editions of the mystical theology of Dionys Dionysus of the Areopagite. People who are not Christian, read him. Interesting, isn't it? Hardly anybody goes to church in Vienna nowadays. Somebody's buying the Areopagite. Who? Fascinating. <laughs> Fascinating. <laughs> so he's influenced by many figures. For example, the first century uh, Jewish philosopher Philo of Alexandria, who's the first, to our knowledge, to use Moses as a depiction, as an image of contemplative ascent, which is... The, the ascent of Mount Sinai, you see, becomes the, the metaphor, the image for that, the way to depict it for you in physically. Moses in the book of Exodus, chapter 24. Moses goes up the mountain with Aaron and 72 elders or priests. They get to the, a place that's just below the summit. It's below the dark cloud. And there they have a feast in the presence of God, and they have a vision of his feet. They have a mystical vision. Okay? 
Then Moses continues alone. He gets to the summit without Aaron, without the elders, and he moves into darkness. And this becomes a symbol for the perfection of human knowledge, human contemplation, and union with God. And this Moses is supposed to be the model for the rest of us. At least some of us. If you pay close attention, Dionysus seems to think that maybe only bishops and monks and maybe maybe nuns can get there, but this is another issue for another day. Okay? So they've dined, they've dined in God's presence. Apparently God provided the food, I'm not sure, but certainly he provided the, the vision of his feet. Now you realize God doesn't have any feet, right? Because he doesn't have a body. <laughs> He creates a vision of his feet for people who know he doesn't have any. <laughs> so he's walking in the Garden of Eden, right? But he doesn't have a body. He creates a vision of himself walking. As opposed to the Incarnation, right? Which is far more than a vision. It's completely different. Dionysus first will describe the contemplation of God's place. Okay? It's one step below perfect union. This is the text number four. It's going to be dense. Just don't worry about it. God's place signifies the following. Quote, the most divine and highest of what is seen and intelligible. Then these are the hypothetical logoi of what is subordinate to that beyond having all. Through these is shown forth the presence of that which walks upon the intelligible summits of its most holy places, and then Moses abandons those who see and what is seen and enters into the really mystical darkness of unknowing. We'll continue the, the text shortly. Okay? It's very obscure. Only a, a few specialists in the world in the history of philosophy and theology can interpret this text well. And this is what the specialists tell me. See, I, I focus on the 13th century. I, I'm not an expert on the 6th century, but I read people who are experts. And they say, well... The place of God stands for the summit of positive human knowledge. When I say positive, think back to affirmative names that I described earlier, the first of the three steps of divine naming. When people say God is one or God is good, which is always in their minds in reference to some unity, like the unity of you, your being, the unity of your faculties, see? This is by analogy with God's unity, and it's always popping into your mind when you ponder God's unity, some kind of creaturely unity. Dionysus thinks that the most we can know about these attributes of God, like goodness, is attained at this level of ascent, the metaphorical place that is below the ultimate stopping point. This is where all positive knowledge that philosophy and human experience and scripture and tradition can give you. This is the most it can give you. It ends here. The contemplative names God to the extent that he's manifest in creation, to the, to the extent that he's described by, say, a philosophical or biblical tradition in his creative and saving work. Beyond that, we have a different knowledge that goes beyond language, beyond concepts, beyond specific thoughts and ideas. That's where Moses goes. Text number five. The blue halo... Moses abandons those who see. He abandons Aaron and the elders. He abandons what is seen, the metaphorical vision of the feet. He enters into the really mystical darkness of unknowing. In this, he shuts out every knowing apprehension and comes to be, and the wholly imperceptible and invisible, being entirely of that beyond all, of nothing, neither himself nor another, united most excellently by the completely unknowing inactivity of every knowledge, and knowing beyond intellect by knowing nothing. Oh my goodness. What in the world is he talking about? You thought St. Thomas Aquinas was hard. <laughs> Darkness signifies the silent state of the mind. Moses has ceased naming God. Naming God. Think liturgy. Think biblical meditation. Think philosophical study. He no longer names God. Because any use of affirmative names, such as beauty or goodness, require the use of specific concepts and terms, and probably also images in your mind. You're imagining the beauty of the dog, right? Or some other creature 
when naming God in this way, the contemplative is still employing concepts derived from the universe, from creation. The problem is that creatures embody these perfections in a limited mode, a limited way. To reach perfect union, one has to go beyond all limitation and therefore beyond all language. What does Moses do in the dark cloud? He no longer acts. He, his mind stops operating, doing anything. He stops gazing upon all of creation. He doesn't gaze upon any single creature at all. Darkness is a paradoxical expression for God's transcendence. God's light is so bright that it's darkness in relation to us. And Moses knows nothing, the text says, in the sense that whatever he knows surpasses everything he's known so far or by other means, by means of the senses, huh? the means of his mind's activity. Spiritual light, divine light, floods the mind. It can do so because the mind is disposed, is receptive, is passive. There's no human activity, and so God's light can come in fully. Notice that Dionysian con contemplation at this level is not passive in the sense that somebody's practicing a passive mo method of meditation, something they learn in class somewhere. It's a gratuitous divine act. Dionysius's Moses can simply prepare for it. See, it's a gift, it's a grace. God, in fact, will fully complete the emptying of the mind so as to fill it. Okay? Now, that's Dionysus. And that might trigger for you memories of all sorts of spiritual texts, Christian or other, other texts, that you have read or heard about. And it should. Thomas knew this text because he learned it as a student when his teacher, St. Albert the Great, had just founded a new school of theology on the banks of the Rhine in Cologne in 1248. Thomas is there learning it from this master, Albert, who was called great in his lifetime. Nobody else was, by the way. The greatest German theologian of the Middle Ages was his teacher. Taught this text line by line, taught the entire corpus of Dionysus line by line to his graduate students. And Aquinas will use this text and he'll twist it and tweak it and change it dramatically in a way that fascinates me. And you'll see why. You may not agree with Thomas, but you'll see why it's fascinating to see what he does with the text. See, when traditions shift and change, you have to ask why. And if you find the answer, sometimes it's utterly amazing. It might be much more interesting than the actual change itself. It shows you what makes a thinker tick. What does Aquinas do? He develops what's called a theology of the seven gifts of the spirit, and within those seven gifts he'll develop one, which is the gift of understanding, which he'll closely relate to knowing God in darkness. This is what he does. First of all, we're going to deal with Thomas approaching the dark cloud with the spirit's action through seven gifts, and this comes from the book of Isaiah. Chapter 11. The Messiah, the coming Messiah, is the anointed one. Right? It's in Greek, Messiah is the anointed one. And the, the Spirit comes upon him and rests upon him in these seven different ways. Or maybe it's six, it's disputed by the exegetes, but that's beside the point. That's not for us to study. There's wisdom and understanding and counsel and fortitude, etc. Huh? These various powerful gifts that help the Messiah to be a just ruler and wise. In Christian theology, that kind of anointing, that sevenfold anointing, is participated in by the disciples. It's not just for the Messiah. So, for example, in the Catholic liturgy, the ritual of uh, confirmation makes explicit reference to these seven gifts. So the Spirit imparts whatever you want to call it, motion, light, power, that elevates the virtues of the Christian disciple so as to lead a life of sanctity or come toward, move into a life of sanctity. And the result of the Spirit doing this, especially in the gift of understanding, as we'll see, is to enable one to live the Beatitudes. The Beatitudes are, of course, the ones mentioned by Christ in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5. Right? Blessed are the poor in spirit, theirs is the kingdom of God, etc. We'll talk about the Beatitudes in a moment. Among the seven gifts, we have understanding. In Latin, it's intellectus. 
What does intellectus do? It perfects faith by illuminating you in a new way so as to enable you to live the beatitude of the pure of heart. Blessed are the pure of heart, for they shall see God. By the gift of understanding, you will come to an indirect glimpse of God in this life and a direct one in the next. Aquinas thinks that the faithful disciple will inevitably be led more and more and illumined more and more by the Holy Spirit to live these Beatitudes, that the Beatitudes, in fact, are a kind of roadmap that describe what the saints are already doing in this life. But only by grace or by the Holy Spirit does it work. And all those saints, all those saints get to get go into the dark cloud. All of them. In this life. And it's linked with the purity of heart. And we'll see how Thomas connects these. Right? It'll be a little bit complicated because it's scholastic, but ultimately it'll be very clear because it's scholastic. <laughs> <laughs> that makes them so much fun. It's like a puzzle. You start the puzzle, you're frustrated by it to no end. But then you start to see how the puzzle works. You go, whoa, this connects to that and connects to that and this and this. Whoa, wow. Oh. You go into intellectual ecstasy, you see, when you get there. And then you realize there are more ecstasies to come because I've only found 10% of what's there. You never study a figure just to see what the his historical figure thought. You do the contemplative act with him. You engage in the philosophical, theological act of judgment with him, you see. Even when he's a little bit, little bit wrong or very wrong, you see why he's wrong, and you learn so much. <laughs> Blessed are the pure of heart, for they shall see God. Matthew chapter 5, verse 8. Aquinas follows a very long theological tradition that says, you know, when Scripture says, uh, we're seeking the vision of God, when the psalmist prays with his desire to see God, when Moses asks God to show him his face, this is a way of, to speak of communion or intense union with God. That also involves the mind. The mind has an eye. That's classical philosophy. The mind sees, but not physically. In the Summa, in the second part of the second part, question 8, article 6, Thomas explains this beatitude. He says, Purity of heart is attained in those who have advanced well in the Spirit's gift of understanding. He doesn't give you a checklist to see if you've advanced well. Huh? It's very interesting. It presumes a life of intense virtue. That's for sure. The purified heart comes to see God first indirectly, that's in this life, and then later in the next life, face to face. And this is how Aquinas explains the pure of heart. It's text number six. He says two things are contained in, in this beatitude, the sixth beatitude, as in the other beatitudes. There's one thing that is by mode of merit, that's the purity of heart. And there's something else by mode of reward, namely the vision of God. Uh, I act virtuously to attain the purity of heart. I merit a reward. And the reward given is a certain um, understanding or vision. Right? Each of these pertains to the gift of understanding in, that in some way. Purity of heart is twofold. Purity is twofold, he says. One is a preamble and a disposition for the vision of God which is the affects purification from disordered affections. I'm literally translating the Summa for you. You'll see why. And this purity of heart occurs through the virtues and the gifts that pertain to the appetitive power. The other purity of heart is as perfective in view of the divine vision, and this is the purity of mind, purified of phantasms and errors. The things which are proposed about God not to be taken, that they not be taken by the mode of corporeal phantasms nor according to heretical perversities. And the gift of understanding brings about this purity. It's a very dense text, huh? So I spent probably about six or ten months chewing on this, you know, and eventually I got somewhere. He's talking about the Spirit's work and the gift of understanding that enables a mystical cognition and that there is a pre preliminary step. You have to be disposed for the knowledge. There's a purification of heart and a reordering, a healing, you might say, of the affections. What's that? That's especially the passions, the emotions. 
He's referring to growth in the cardinal virtues like justice, fortitude, and temperance. What's he doing? He's evoking a timeless principle. It's this. To advance in the contemplative life, you have to practice asceticism and lead a life of virtue. It's so basic that he doesn't even say it for you in a very direct way. He says it in this more roundabout way. Why? Because in his context, it's kind of like saying, water's wet. If you don't practice asceticism and live the virtues, you can't have good contemplation. That should be obvious to you. We 21st century Americans probably don't understand that, right? Because we live in a very materialistic, consumeristic, individualistic culture. So many traditions of contemplation will tell it to you. Ask any Buddhist monk or nun they'll tell you the exact same thing. The ancient philosophers understood this, by the way. The pagan philosophers, pre-Christian. Water's wet. <laughs> if you gorge yourself on, on hamburgers every, every day, you will not advance in the spiritual life. Aquinas then says that there's a purity of heart by which the spirit removes errors and phantasms from our way of understanding God. As he moves forward in this text, it's actually a parallel with the uh, Dionysian mystical theology and the ascent of Moses, who is supposed to leave behind images or phantasms, leave behind various things like concepts to move into the dark cloud. Thomas takes all of that language and that kind of structure, <coughs> but he uses it very differently. For Dionysus, you're supposed to let go of the images. In other words, stop contemplating with the icon. Listen to the scriptures. And after a while, the counsel will be, you no longer should ponder with the scriptures, but let God teach you directly. Stop pondering the icon. That's the advice from Dionysus. Thomas thinks that in this life, the intellect, an immaterial reality, by the way, can only function when it works together with the phantasms or the images that the brain has produced and stored. Without it, you can't know anything. Not even the most abstract thoughts will be accessible to you or intelligible to you. In other words, the mind has to keep using concepts and images, or what we call phantasms in technical language. Now notice, Thomas isn't arguing that the information, the intelligible content, huh? the data being given to you must only come through the senses. He gets it that there's something that can come directly from God, but he can only appropriate it and actually make sense of it by connecting it with what he knows through the senses, through the scriptures, through philosophy, through tradition. So here's the distinction Thomas makes. The concepts and images we use in contemplative ascent are not adequate. They're never adequate. But they're essential for the mind to function at all. Why? The unity of the body and the soul. So Dionysus wants to start with sense experience, especially the liturgy, and ascend to a place where you let go of it. So the scriptures are like a ladder that you need to move up, but eventually you can set the ladder aside and but just be taught directly. Aquinas thinks you can never set the ladder aside. You can never set creation and the liturgy aside. You'll always need them. You'll always need what we call the mediations. Why? I propose that he's drawing a consequence of the doctrine of the incarnation. Don't stop contemplating the humanity of Christ. You'll be lost without it. That's what he's saying. In text number six, Aquinas says that the pure of heart avoid erroneous interpretations about God. This applies especially to the mysteries of faith contained in scripture. Mysteries like the passion and resurrection of Christ, his baptism, etc. Thomas says that there is a purified contemplation of scripture. The pure of heart behold and correctly understand God's saving acts, whereby his limitless perfections like wisdom and mercy shine forth. The removal of error from our way of conceiving the biblical teaching leaves standing the affirmation given to me in the scripture or in the liturgy or in the philosophical principle articulated for me. 
the intelligible content given to me about the divine nature or the life of the Trinity. Negative names correct our misconceptions about the divine mystery or the misreading of a sacred name of Christ like Redeemer or Lamb of God. And so you see, there is no longer the silent mind of Moses because Thomas thinks that if the mind is completely silent, it literally knows nothing and that's really bad. <laughs> Translation. Aquinas' account of Christian spirituality says that every religious act of worship and adoration and contemplation and prayer never leaves the mind behind. Religion without the brain is dangerous and foolish. That's the translation. That's the consequence. That's the principle that stands behind this. Thomas says, the dark cloud, specifically as conceived by Dionysus, doesn't exist. It's impossible. It's for angels. It's not for you. You have a body. Accept it. The person who meditates in perfect stillness, thinking of nothing, and thinking they are experiencing God, is fooling themselves. They are the victims of their own imagination. This leads me to text 7. And I'm running out of time because I don't want to take all of the Q&A time. So what am I going to do here? I'm going to give you the quick... The quick uh, quick account. I'm going to skip part of the last section I prepared for you, which is actually quite juicy. It's Union with God by Charity, and this is very disappointing. But we'll read a little bit about Charity, and then you can go home and meditate some more. Text number seven. He's finishing the article we've been reading. Okay, We're still in the same text. Here's what he says. The vision of God is twofold. One is perfect, through which God's essence is seen. The other is imperfect, through which, although we do not see what God is, the divine nature, we still see what he is not. In this life, the more perfectly we know God, the more we understand him to exceed whatever we comprehend by the intellect. Each vision of God pertains to the gift of understanding. The first vision pertains to the consummated gift of understanding, as it will be in heaven. The second pertains to the imperfect gift of understanding, as it is possessed on the way by the pilgrim technical term for the believer in this life moving toward heaven by the grace of Christ. What do we learn here? He's still very interested in what we call negative knowledge. To know the quiddity of God, the quiddest, to know what he is, is to have the direct vision of God that fully satisfies the mind. This is for the next life. In this life, he says, you will never comprehend God. You'll never wrap your mind around him. He thinks that the humanity of Christ in his human mind didn't comprehend or wrap his mind around the essence of the Trinity. That's striking, isn't it? It's very striking. What are you supposed to do? You're supposed to realize that you know especially what God is not, how he's different, how he's so much beyond the creatures with their perfections. You're smashing intellectual idols. You think you figured God out, you you have figured out who God is, but you are utterly fooling yourself if you think you've figured out absolutely everything, or if you've perfectly comprehended some aspect of his action or his interior life. And so you see, we inevitably use analogies and metaphors in philosophy and theology to describe God, and many of them are true and very helpful. The ancient Greek theologians would speak of the Father is like a fountain that is flowing forth, and there are two streams coming from the fountain, from the fount, and those two streams are like the Son and the Holy Spirit. It's true, but it says 1% of what should be said, and we'll never get to 100% in this life, and actually not even in the next one. No interior teaching of God will actually give that to you. But Thomas thinks that the Holy Spirit can actually give that kind of knowledge of this vast distance between, between the creaturely perfections, like wisdom and beauty, and God. He can give it to you by a direct kind of interior teaching, which he calls the gift of understanding. This is why the church mouse can be much wiser than the professional philosopher or professional theologian. By the way, do you know what the French version is of the church mouse? No. The holy water fount frog. 
<laughs> I love it. They don't say church mouse. If you say church mouse in French, they won't know what you mean. You have to say the holy water fountain frog. They'll know what you mean. <laughs> what are you pondering in for St. Thomas by the gift of understanding? You are penetrating more and more into the heart, into the hidden meaning of the scriptures and of the creed because he says the gift of understanding is about grasping the articles of faith. What are the articles of faith? They're the central teachings of God brought to you in the scriptures that are summarized for you in the creed. That's what you're pondering. <clears throat> Every mystery presented in scripture, whether it's the baptism or the passion or resurrection of Christ or Pentecost or some other event that you can think of, will give to you all sorts of created effects, manifestations of God, and you'll see more and more ways in which God is manifest in them and yet so far beyond them. What should this provoke? It should provoke great awe and reverence and adoration. But it never leaves the mind behind. The mind never stops functioning and searching and looking for clues. What I've given to you with Aquinas, this little, little tiny selection from his corpus, is an account of mystical cognition which is marvelously uninterested in special moments in prayer or meditation. He's not interested in them. He knows they happen. They're not that important. It's very, very fascinating, I think. He's interested in a kind of habitual, ongoing, daily knowledge of God that is enabled by grace. Okay, we're running out of time. What I'm going to do for you is this. I'm going to read for you text 11 and give you a brief conclusion, and then we'll discuss. Okay? Notice I've been focusing for 90% of the time here on knowledge. That's because that's where the Greeks have their focus. The ancient Greeks were terribly interested in the noose, the mind, and how it can know the, the highest things. Only gradually, with the influence of St. Augustine and Maximus the Confessor, did they also develop a very strong interest in the other aspect of the will, of the heart, of love. So we've been looking at <coughs> just sort of this one little sector of mystical theology. We'll look at one other sector, a very important, a crucial one. It might even be the central one. Here's Aquinas describing what the Eucharist does to those who receive it. This is what he says on text 11. By the sacrament of the Eucharist, not only is habitual grace and virtue bestowed on the recipient, the sacrament also arouses us to act following 2 Corinthians 5, verse 14. The charity of Christ urges us on, it says. Hence it is that the soul, spiritually nourished by the power of the sacrament, nourished by being spiritually gladdened, and as it were, inebriated with the sweetness of the divine goodness. According to the Song of Songs, Eat, O oh friends, and drink, and be inebriated, my dearly beloved. So this and a series of other texts, especially from the liturgy of Corpus Christi, deserve a whole other lecture, but I can't give it to you. We'll be here till midnight if I do. So I say to you, go and meditate on the liturgy of Corpus Christi, and go and read a book by Darius Spisano about the char charity and divinization in Aquinas. Spezzano, S-P-E-Z-Z-A-N-O, Daria. For Thomas, what do mystics do? They obviously don't turn off the mind. Well, for Dionysus, God ultimately turns off the mind's action so that he can do other things, you see? Aquinas thinks that that's impossible. God cannot do impossible things that are contradictory, okay? He can make a virgin give birth, but he cannot make one plus one equal three. They would contradict his own wisdom. So if they don't turn off the mind, what are they supposed to do for Thomas? How, how can you be a mystic? For Thomas, this is how. I'm going to give you the secret, okay? This is it. You do three things. Number one, imitate the virtues of Christ. No purified affections and passions, no union, nothing. Imitate the virtues of Christ. 
the Holy Spirit helps one to do it by his gifts. Number two, meditate on the scriptures using all of your mental capacities, all of your good training, all good traditions, all the power of your mind. Meditate on the scriptures. Look for God in them. Number three, go to Mass. Without the charity of the Eucharist, you will not ascend. That's the secret formula. There's no secret method of meditation. You don't need it. You might find a method that helps you. Great. It's not absolutely essential. It's so beautifully simple. Now let me summarize in one sentence. I'll finish here. Let me summarize what I would call the mysticism of St. Thomas. God is not nameless. In, in, in the Parmenides, you saw that God is beyond names, right? Beyond language. God is not nameless for Thomas. Why? Because he's manifested himself in creation to Israel and especially in Christ. And so God must be named endlessly, praised without end, and loved evermore. Thank you for your attention.